Hey guys, my guest today, Mark A. Carpenter, is going to be talking about the mysteries of the Mexican pyramids and the Nephilim. See you in about five minutes. Grab your popcorn and snacks, find a comfy spot, take a seat or lie down, and let me transport you to a place of fantasy, ghost stories, ancient legends, odd creatures, alien encounters, and other magical topics. You may even decide to join the conversation. From faraway lands to your own backyard, 
with a small dash of pixie dust. Turn out the lights and open your minds. The journey is about to begin. Hey everybody, happy 4th of July. I hope you're not all out there blowing up your neighborhoods, but uh, kind of fun to do that anyway. Welcome, welcome, welcome to California Haunts Radio. My name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host for the next hour. I'm also the owner of the California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team based out of Sacramento, California. We are 45 strong up and down the state of California, which means if you have a paranormal lead, we can get to you. It might take us a while because California is a huge state. And what a lot of people don't realize is we still have wide open plains and deserts and all that stuff. So it might take us a couple days, but uh, we will get to you. And in the case that we have to take our t take a little extra time to get out there, we do have mediums on staff that can call you and talk to you about uh, what may be going on paranormal-wise in your neck of the woods. Okay? So if you want to find us, you can find us here on Facebook. Let me adjust here. Um, you can find us here on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on on uh, Instagram, you can find us on TikTok, you can find us on Twitch, you can find us on Twitter, right? So on Facebook, you can look it up under California Haunts, you can look it up under my personal name, if you know that, okay? You can look it up under, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Instagram, it is under Ghosty Gal. Over at Twitter, I think it's California Haunts, or Cal Haunts. Uh, over at Twitch, I think it's Cal Haunts. And on TikTok, it is officially, excuse me, I hate when things hang on me. You guys know that. On TikTok, it's California Haunts, all lowercase. On uh, Instagram, it's Ghosty Gal. So you can find me over there, shoot me a message, and I will get back to you ASAP. Anyway, we've got a great show for you tonight. Something I'm interested in is ancient history. I love ancient history, and I love mysterious ancient history. So we're going to be talking about the Mexican mysteries of the Mexican pyramids and the Nephilim tonight. So that's kind of cool. So... Just sit tight before we get going, you know, we'll get going on this. Okay, if you're watching from Facebook, and a lot of you are, and you haven't done so already, please, and, and you like what you see tonight, please, please hit that follow button if you haven't done so already. Also, what I ask you to do is hit those thumbs up and those hearts and the smiley faces, because what it does is it puts us into the, into the algorithm. It makes the algorithm take notice of us, so it puts this video out there farther. So that people, you know, more people can see it and, and, and enjoy it. Enjoy it, enjoy it, whatever. So more people can see it. Same thing with YouTube. If you like what you see tonight, please be sure to do a, you know, thumbs up, happy face, whatever. Because that puts us in their algorithm up higher. All right? They both work the same way. So does TikTok, actually. Most of these places, these things work the same way. Also on YouTube, if you haven't done so already, please uh, feel free to subscribe. We have 631 videos sitting over there. And uh, I've taken and put those videos under categories because since there's so many, and there's so many types of videos, I'm a journalist, I'm a photojournalist, I don't like to cover the same things every day, okay? I don't. So you, you're, you're going to get a, a variety. Like if you want to find stuff by Nancy Matz, you're going to find it under, under a folder for Nancy Matz. If you're into UFOs and abductees, you're going to find the contactees. I keep getting in trouble with that. You're going to find that under UFOs and contactees. If you're in a cryptid, you're going to find it under a cryptid file, et cetera, et cetera. And also, because I'm a journalist, I don't like to do paranormal stuff all the time. I like to do real life stories and things like that, just like I just had, to, you know, we like to do shipwrecks. We like to do um, murder cases. We, we like to do, uh, you know, talk about spousal abuse and anxiety and things like that. So you're going to find that as well. So I think there's something for a little something for everybody over, uh, over there if you, if you go through our videos. Okay, the other thing I ask is that maybe you're in you're at home tonight, you know, and everybody's having d dinner or whatever, you know, barbecue. Maybe <laughs> listening to me at the barbecue, I don't know. You know, if there's someone you think might be interested in our shows, have them come over and check it out. Just say, hey, you know what? There's this little show over here that's that's pretty good, and and I, I think you might like it. And so, you know, we're just trying to spread the word about the show. Just trying to spread the word. Okay, that being done. I do have a class this Saturday that's sold out, but Sunday I have an event of, of that this might be interesting to people who want a ghost hunt, but they don't want to be tied down to a ghost hunt team. They just like to do it on their own. And uh, my, my team has been investigating for almost 20 years. So what I'm, uh, what I'm offering is I'm going to give you a list of places to go where you don't have to pay to get in, where you can go with your family and just ghost hunt. You might want to have lunch. You might want to stay there overnight. And you can do your own ghost hunting as long as you don't disturb anybody else in the, in, in the building, right? 
So I want to give you that list. And not only that, I'm going to share some of the evidence that we got in those places to give you a little incentive and a little bit of the story behind of, of the hauntings in there. Okay. So uh, that's the plus. That'll be Sunday afternoon. So check that out. That's going to be July 8th. Head on over to the California Haunts Paranormal per Head over to the California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team Meetup and check that out. It'll be under events. Okay. So uh, yeah, it'd be great to have you on in the in, in this in, in the seminar. It's not a class, it's a seminar to teach you guys this. Okay. My guest today, Mark A. Carpenter, is an archaeologist and he has done work in, as I said earlier, in Mexico with the pyramids. And he's traveled really all over the world. And he's done some really interesting studies and he's going to be here today to talk about that and and where and, and how the Mifflin was involved with all this and um, he's got some interesting things to say about that so without further ado let's bring him on tell me about you so 20 years ago i was studying um the ancient maya i i was very interested from from childhood about ancient mysteries and ancient history and i found myself studying archaeology and anthropology at the university of north carolina and they had a program in which uh, you could intern and 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 study study my get mine archaeology on the yucatan peninsula and I was determined to understand the mysteries of ancient pyramids. And what I ended up finding really was a cover up instead. And it, and it shattered my entire paradigm of, of institutional science and, and ancient history as well. When you talk about cover up, what, what do you mean exactly? Well, I, I had focused my research on a particular site known as Palenque. Mm -hmm. And I chose that site specifically because of the, pretty much the greatest discoveries ever made in, in the history of, of Mayan archaeology were the discovery of two royal tombs mm -hmm. of, of rulers known as Pakal and the Red Queen. And they were entombed within burial chambers underneath pyramids. And what I found was that there were missing reports in the INAH archives. Mm -hmm. That's the Institute, uh, that's the National Institute of Archaeology and History, Anthropology, excuse me, and History. And the excavation reports, which, by the way, were funded uh, jointly with the Rockefeller Foundation, these reports were missing, which is very suspicious because they, as I said, they, these are probably the, the biggest archaeological discoveries in the history of Mayan archaeology. Very interesting. And uh, there's more than just the missing just the missing records beyond the missing records there was also a very strong forbidden reluctance to reveal certain aspects of of the information that was available for example the many of the rulers were of gigantic stature mm -hmm. That, that's how they were depicted in iconography, and then that was reinforced by some of the information that was available from the reports. And then that information was later contradicted in more official reports. So, for example, they said initially in the uh, excavation reports of Pakal from 1952 that he was a very tall stature mm -hmm. and, and stout, robust build. Thick, thick bone density, which indicates a very muscular frame. And his sarcophagus is nine and over nine feet tall, almost 10 feet long. Wow. And they claimed officially that he was five foot seven. Wow, that's a big difference. Yes. And there was a lot more. He, we know that both him and Pakal had elongated skulls. They had deformed skulls. Mm-hmm. And 
And the iconography also indicates that their their ruling bloodline, many of them were polydactyls, meaning they had extra fingers and toes. Okay. And all of this was being suppressed. And perhaps the biggest suppression uh, for me was they contradicted themselves regarding the DNA analyses. So they claimed that due to degradation of the remains, they were unable to get viable uh, DNA from their harvests. Mm -hmm. But then later in the official report, they contradicted themselves and said, well, we did get uh, genetic results and genetic material, viable genetic material, and that it indicated Pakal and the Red Queen were not of blood relation. Wow, okay. So what did that, as far as you know, you looking into this, you know, essentially a cover-up, what did that mean to you? Well, what that means to me is that they're not, they're guilty of scientific misconduct. Hmm. And they are deliberately distorting human history. And I found linkage in other ancient traditions, like, for example, the biblical tradition. The biblical tradition makes reference to the Nephilim, okay. who were the antediluvian hybridized race who were cannibalistic, which that's another parallel. Mm -hmm. Because there was evidence of ritual cannibalism. And they also were operating, they meaning the ruling elite, the call and the Red Queen, they were the they were the leaders of uh, a cult that practiced dragon worship and, and human sacrifice. Wow, okay. And it seemed to me that this was a clear linkage, uh, not just to biblical, ancient biblical tradition, mm -hmm. uh, but other ancient traditions around the world as well, which also involved hybridized dragon kings and and these dra with corresponding dragon deities and pyramids, like ancient China, for example. Okay. Okay. Do you think that? They wanted to hide this stuff because it, it would be too much for people to handle, essentially? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think it's more nefarious than that. Okay. Um, of, course, I, of course, I can't say uh, precisely what, what, their, what their agendas and motives are for, for scientific misconduct. However... Um, I, I think it would be giving them the benefit of the doubt to think that this was somehow in people's best interest and they didn't want to freak people out. No, mm -hmm. no, I, I think the people who fund these types of science are um, themselves have a, a skin in the game and they don't uh, want the public to know the truth of their own history. Okay. Because that, see, that sort of information is, is power. So we're talking about the few who rule over the many, and they would prefer them to subscribe to certain paradigms. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. So how hard was it to find this information out? It, it, well, it, it, it ultimately cost me my career. Um, but, but in terms of getting to this information, it, this day and age, uh, with the internet, it, it's not that difficult. Um, I, you can, uh, search out, I have it here somewhere. Well, any, anyway, uh, here we are. Yeah. Uh, so, so Tesla and, uh, uh, Cusina and, and, uh, Janapa call of Palenque. Uh, University of Arizona Press. That that's their 
that's their end all be all uh, report mm-hmm. on Pakal and the Red Queen, and that's readily available to anybody. And these contradictions are within that report. The INA, the, the reports missing from the INH archives, that, that takes some rather um, intense digging. Mm-hmm. But the iconography and the evidence of cannibalism and human sacrifice and just basic contradictions, uh, like, for example, another is that, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of very sophisticated engineering and architecture at these ancient sites. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the oldest known pressurized aqueduct on Earth is present here at Palenque. And they would have us believe that they cut and transported all this stone and created things like a pressurized aqueduct, and yet they would simultaneously have us believe that they did not have understanding of the wheel. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's something. That's absolutely fascinating, actually. So, again, you, I'm, I mean, is, is this trying, trying to hide, hide all this on purpose or, or no? They're definitely trying to hide all of this on purpose. Absolutely. Um, they, uh, we, 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 as the, as the people tend to think, I mean, this was certainly my naive belief at the time mm-hmm. that scientists are out there working together. They may squabble amongst each other, but, but we generally think they're practicing objective science and they're doing so for the benefit of humanity. And they're arriving at the objective truth. Mm-hmm. We, we, we like to think that's what institutional science is and does. Uh-huh. But that's just not accurate. Um, scientific institutions are controlled by human beings. And these are ruling elite human beings of the modern day. Uh, like the Rockefellers and the Rockefeller Foundation. Right. and. Right. If, if you look more into their history and you see who these people are and what they're about, you will then start to see that they are not, they are not funding institutional science and institutional education for the benefit of humanity, but, but, but for their own purposes. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, so for example, uh, John D. Rockefeller founded the Board of Education in America. And he said publicly that, quote, I don't want thinkers, I want workers, end mm-hmm. quote. And he was a psychopath, by the way. Really? Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He, he was, his father, his father was known as Devil Bill. And he was a literal snake oil salesman and uh, real estate con man. He was also a rapist and probably he was involved in all sorts of uh, dirty crimes in, in his life. And and this is part, and this is not my opinion or, or speculation. This is coming from their biographies. Uh, Devil Bill was a, a sociopath and, and he deliberately... Um, killed all the trust in his children, like John D. Rockefeller. Uh, He constantly lied to them and deceived them and was cruel to them, and he did this in order to train them to be a sharpened psychopath like himself. Hmm. And, um, yeah, and and when, when John D. Rockefeller founded the Board of Education, he did so just as he said uh, to indoctrinate people into industrial slavery rather than to expand their education for the, for the good of mankind. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So as you're researching this stuff and, and you said yourself, you lost your job over it. How, how, how'd that come about? Well, well, when, when, when I was, when I was researching Pakal and the Red Queen, I started, 
uh, well, I made it very clear to them that this this was going to be my focus of research, uh, like my doctoral uh, uh, dissertation. Mm-hmm. And they explained to me that this was a taboo subject and uh, they were very discouraging, which I found completely bizarre. At the time, I was still naive about it. Mm-hmm. And um, I began asking very irritating questions like, why are these why are these reports missing from the archives? Where are these DNA profiles? Where are where are these remains? I forgot to mention that. You see, the the, the contradictions and, and lies and controversies stack up so quickly; it's easy to lose track of them all. Okay. Uh, these remains, the the bones, the skeletons mm-hmm. of both Pakal and the Red Queen, are now missing. They're nowhere to be found, and that doesn't matter if you're a if you're a PhD from Harvard or just a regular person. Um, no, nobody has access to these remains and nobody has access to the burial chambers Hmm. either. And so I was very confrontational about this and ultimately, uh, well, well, it, it, it mutated and mass metastasized that at first they were, at first they just tried to discourage me. And then when they found they couldn't discourage me, then it was more about, it was more about, uh, well, this is how they operate. Then they offer you something. Mm-hmm. And, 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 uh, when I, and I wouldn't, I won't be, I won't be bribed or leveraged. And so at that point, at that point, it, it, it was, it was, it, it's an orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. So at that point, it's either, it's either get into lockstep with their narrative or you're, or your career will come to a grinding halt, and that's exactly what happened. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of that for that point when they supposedly found those uh, those giant skeletons in, in that cave in Arizona, up in the Grand Canyon. Yeah, Love Love Lock. Cave. Yeah, and then all that disappeared. Oh, absolutely! But the more you research this, the more you'll find this pattern repeating itself over and over again. Uh, skeletons ancient skeletons of gigantic stature and by the way those lovelock uh those lovelock skeletons that you mentioned right those were also wrapped up in cannibalism as well hmm. the the um the paiutes uh sarah winamanaka if you want to look into it in her her, her chronicles uh, she by the way she was a the daughter of a paiute elder and she wrote fabulous uh, books about um, uh, Paiute tradition. She wrote about, they're called the Sitaka. And the Sitaka were a race of red-haired cannibalistic giants that lived in that region. Okay. And they conflicted with the Paiutes because the Paiutes were the victims of their abduction and cannibalism. And so eventually, according to uh, Sarah's account, the Paiutes cornered them in a cave and uh, killed them. Okay. And then those artifacts and and that and, and she wrote about this long before that discovery was ever made at Lovelock Cave. Huh. And then guano miners uh, digging out the the bat waste, which has um, fertilization uh, applications. Mm-hmm. Once they dug out the, they were digging out the guano, and they found bones and artifacts that completely vindicated uh, the Paiute tradition of the Sitaka. And yes, indeed, those those bones are now missing. But I have photographs of them. A lot of people were able to photograph and document those bones and some of the artifacts are still around but for the most part yes that has all been covered up see what i don't get and i agree with you that obviously there's something nefarious going on i just don't i can't can't wrap my head around why they would cover that stuff up because it's a part of history well uh, I think what you'll find is that, and in fact, I know if, if you look into this more carefully, the, the ruling elite do not, 
the ruling elite are the and and their scientific institutions like mm -hmm. the Smithsonian, for example, and like the education system. They are the ones who invented and promoted the Darwin, uh, the social Darwinist narrative. Okay. And they prefer that human beings think of themselves as as naturally evolved apes mm -hmm. because that reduces them to animals. Okay. And it sense. and it and it undermines ancient traditions like Native American ancient tradition or like biblical tradition. They would prefer people not believe in these things and would instead uh, believe that they are nothing but animals living in a pointless materialistic mm -hmm. consumer existence. Of course, someone's going to call. That's how it is. Um, <laughs> don't you hate when people do that? Uh, this is all. So, so did were you able to go to Mexico and see these? Uh, obviously, you did, right? And th that you got to go to Mexico and see the pyramids. Oh yes. And so, oh, what, yes. what, did you ask any questions at that point? Because I mean, did you have a guide with you or anything like that to go go through these things? Oh well, well, I, I've conducted my own personal investigation into these. I, I was never one for guided tours. I, I was more <laughs> on the uh, on the on the inside of mm -hmm. such things. Um, but I've researched pyramids all over Mexico and all over the world. I haven't. I haven't. I don't have firsthand experience with all the uh, pyramids uh, in the world, of course. But I'm very intimately familiar with. Um, pyramid construction in, in Mesoamerica. Um, yeah, let's clarify too that you are an anthropologist, so that that, that makes a lot of sense. What, what what is your main feeling on all this? Well, I think we were just touching on it uh, right there. That my my main feeling on this is that institutional science, right is corrupt to the core and they're misleading people and this all goes much much deeper and, and what we really find is some degree of validation of, of ancient tradition native american mesoamerican biblical and these these traditions what i have found have have parallel uh, themes that reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. Primarily, that in prehistoric times, Homo sapiens, our our species, um, coexisted. But, well, and actually, just put a pin in that really quickly. That, that sure. there is some degree of validation even within the mainstream scientific narrative, and then that's because they can't. They, they have a difficult time controlling all of the scientists around the world. And so we, we do know, even according to their narrative, that Homo sapiens coexisted with hominid species mm -hmm. in, in, in very, very ancient times. So think like Neanderthals or, or Denisovans or Homo heidelbergensis or Homo floresiensis. The, the, the deception occurs when they want to portray them as evolutionary rejects, monkey men, cave people. They, they were subterranean, and they did live hunter-gatherer existences in caves, but they were not the evolutionary reject monkey men that science portrays them to be. This is all really interesting to me. And, you know... Uh... The, like I, that was my next question: Was when, when, when did these things exist? Well, um, well, I would submit to you that they still exist today. Okay. In in relic relic populations, but but this but their existence proliferated more and more the, the farther back you go. 
Okay. In uh, another parallel in the traditions uh, is the great the great deluge, the flood story. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, that's that's actually a universal tradition around the world. Pretty much every indigenous culture on Earth recalls a a cataclysmic flood. Right. And we we have mainstream verification of this incident, this this global extinction event. They call it the Younger Dryas Impact Event. And we know it occurred because all these species suddenly went extinct somewhere around 13,000 years ago, mm -hmm. like the woolly mammoth, for example. And we also know that there was a, an incredible uh, rise in, in, in uh, sea level. Okay. And so I would suggest to you that, uh, strongly, that these are not myths, but uh, recollections of human history. And, and just as the biblical tradition recalls a, a species of gigantic hybrid humans mm -hmm. who practiced cannibalism and then who were largely wiped out by the, by the cataclysm, there is archaeological validation of that. You just have to read between the lines of a corrupt scientific establishment. Okay. Okay. Now, when you say they had like 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 six toes on their feet, have you personally mm -hmm. seen the skeletons, or or is this is that conjecture for everybody? No, oh, no, no, no. That's yeah. I, that's that that you can doc, you can find that. In within me, there are mainstream archaeologists who documented this, and then I've mm -hmm. seen uh, skeletons and, and bones. I would I would refer anyone uh, who's interested into to the work of archaeologist uh, Patricia Crown. Okay. Archaeologist Patricia Crown has devoted her entire career, decades worth of it, um, to documenting these uh, this phenomena of polydactyly in in Mesoamerica. And, and uh, also, you, you can look into, there was a National Geographic article, I believe it's called Extra Toes and Fingers Were Revered in Ancient Times. Okay. And they are, in that article, they are briefly documenting the ruling elite of Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. And that was really only about a thousand years ago, a little bit more, a little bit over a thousand, eleven hundred years ago. And for anyone who's not familiar, Chaco Canyon is uh, a collection of very mysterious ruins in New Mexico. These circular uh, sunken ritual spaces known as kivas. Mm -hmm. And the ruling elite of, of Chaco Canyon indeed had six toes and six fingers. And not only that, but, but this polydactyly was regarded uh, by the people as evidence of their divine heritage. Huh. So that's absolutely stone cold scientific fact. And by the way, another archaeologist mainstream, uh, Professor Christy Turner and his wife, also Professor Turner, mm -hmm. they devoted their whole careers to proving that the ruling elite of Chaco Canyon practiced ritual cannibalism on a on a vast and horribly unimaginable scale. You know, 30 people at a time, really gruesome, uh, really gruesome, really, really cruel and horrific mm -hmm. practices of, of cannibalism. Oh. And he has proven it, they have proven it definitively. Well, okay. Wow. Well, you know, I've, I've heard stories about, like, like you say, the, the Mayan ruins. And things like that going on, especially with the sacrifices and all that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If you look into the uh, Chronicles of the Conquistadors. Now, now, quick, quick disclaimer. The Conquistadors themselves were, were very savage and, and they... Uh, they were interested in, in conquest, as their name suggests, and 
and gold and and land acquisition. Mm-hmm. So this is not a this is not a, a defense of the uh, of the conquistadors. However, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Mm-hmm. And in in the chronicles of the conquistadors, uh, for example, the rededication of Teotihuacan. That's the very very enigmatic. Um, pyramid complex in, in, in the heart of Mexico's valley. They recall that, they record, I should say, that during the rededication of Teotihuacan by the Aztecs, they, they committed 20,000 human sacrifices a day for four consecutive days. That's a lot. Whoa. So, so just imagine assembly lines of people going up to the different pyramid. There's like a there's a causeway, mm-hmm. and and it's aligned with with step pyramids on each side, and then one gigantic pyramid at the at the 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 heart of it. And there were just assembly lines of victims uh, being systematically sacrificed in 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 very gruesome fashion and there then there is and again this and, and we don't we don't even need to rely entirely on the conquistadors the very limited excavations that have been done at Teotihuacan confirm uh, mass ritual human sacrifice hmm. and uh, let me ask you this if, if they were like the like cannibalizing these people after they did it what what was the point was it because they believe that by eating another soul, that that that, that would bring them more uh, more power in, in, into their bodies, or, or what? Why, why do you think? Um. Yes, that's that's definitely part of it. That's definitely part of it. Uh, the the so the ruling elite, who who were a genetically distinct group. As I was saying, of, of these 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 uh, hybrid descendant uh, species, mm-hmm. so there there there's multi there's multiple purposes for it. One, they're making offerings to their to their deity from whom they descend. Mm-hmm. So if they are hybrids, they trace their progeny back to this initial hybridization between human and Mm non-human and this original non-human from which they descend are whom they are appeasing with ritual blood libation furthermore um yes when, when when a human person is tormented and then murdered their their blood is infused with uh, 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 you know substances like like DMT. Mm-hmm. So we when we dream, our, our brain trickles a little uh, a, a little quantity of of DMT. But when we die, it it dumps the entire reservoir. Not to mention the adrenaline. And various other, you know, psycho spiritual, biological uh, things. And from from a from a spiritual perspective, the spirit is contained within the blood. Okay. And so, yes, by uh, and this is so for that same reason. That's why the the deity is appeased by blood offerings. And furthermore, they themselves would partake in the consumption. Uh, we can think of it like like an entheogen, mm-hmm. and by an entheogen, I mean uh, a psychoactive substance that is used for spiritual purposes. That's just I've been, like I keep saying it over and over, but this stuff just fascinates me. So let me see if I can picture this in my head. So you're going through the pyramids. in in Mexico, and you're starting to realize all this stuff, what was going through your mind as you're looking through there? 
Well, yeah, it's it's been quite a upheaval for me. For many, many years, I looked on these structures with great reverence and awe and fascination. That, like you keep using that word too. Of course, mm-hmm, I was mm-hmm. fascinated by it. But once you understand what they really are and who really built them and what they were all about, now I look at them with a certain degree of disgust. Um, and and where when I was younger, I, I just I, I fantasized about knowing the truth behind them. Mm-hmm. I had fantasized about witnessing their construction. Mm-hmm. I wanted to know the builders. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those be careful what you wish for type situations. Because now, now I do know the mysteries behind them. And now mm-hmm. I look at them and I fantasize really about their destruction. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, well, let's and, talk. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. Please, please, please. Well, I was just going to say, and that that's doubly so mm-hmm. when you when you bring this full circle into the modern context, mm-hmm. because to this day, people are now congregating at Teotihuacan at uh, or places like Stonehenge. We we just had the summer solstice, mm-hmm. and these I, I should have mentioned that, but these monuments are aligned. Uh, astro theologically, mm-hmm. and so during the solstices and other celestial events, people congregate at these sites, and they all they know, all the modern people know, is that these sites are aligned to these astronomical events, and so they go there just to. And, and I, I don't blame them, of course. There's no judgment here, but they. They go there and they and they're they're fascinated and they're awestruck and and they see the astronomical alignments and that's that's understandable. Mm-hmm. But what they don't, but but a lot of it is wrapped up in sort of neo paganism, where they think they're going there to like connect with the energy of the world and 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 they fancy themselves as worshippers of these ancient deities. Um, you know, at, at Stonehenge, for example, the, the neo-pagan people gather there and, and they, they, they chant and go into trances and whatnot. But they have no idea what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and it's almost like a moth to a flame where people want to repeat this, 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 this satanic ritual abuse that their ancestors endured so long ago. Okay. Now, when we talk about the people that build these things, who, who built the pyramids? Well, these these gigantic invasive hominid hybrids. Okay, and why? And like you say, you you figured out who built them and what their purpose was. So, what was the general purpose for them then? Well, it's complex. Um, we we should think of these. So let's okay. So let's let's first talk about sacred mountains. Okay. And and this is another universal parallel in ancient traditions around the world. The sacred mountain. Now, now, academics would have us believe that ancient primitive people regarded mount, certain mountains as sacred because. They go up into the sky, and the closer you are to the sky, the closer you are to the to the heavens and to the deities. Okay. But that's that's part of this scientific institutional corruption. They know perfectly well that there's a lot more to it than that. And what is more into it than that is that certain mountains, due to their geographical and geological location and properties act like a sort of a resonance tuning fork and they sit atop of uh, huge cavities that lead down into the the, the into the subterranean realm of, of the earth. 
So if we think for a moment of mountains and and the cave systems beneath them as a conduit for energy that emanates from within the earth. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about some like, you know, uh, some, you know, some new age, uh, loosey goosey concept of energy. No, no, no. We're talking about real electromagnetic, uh, uh, piezoelectric energy. And we know this energy is real. Uh, we take like a volcano. Mm -hmm. When, 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 when gases and, and lava and things like that, when they, uh, when, when they reach a fulcrum point and they, they push the, this gas and this lava and this, this electromagnetic energy mm -hmm. up into the volcano, that volcano becomes incredibly charged with, with, uh, uh geomagnetic electricity. Okay. And so, right, so that's why these mountains were regarded as sacred. Let's take a really easy example. I think most everybody is generally somewhat vaguely familiar with Greek uh, ancient tradition. Okay. Yes. And so the, the Greek deities, right, the Olympians, were said to dwell atop Mount Olympus. Now, in the Hollywood, uh, which is also extremely corrupt, but in the Hollywood versions, we sort of imagine like a palace up at the top of the mountain where the mm -hmm. gods are like hanging out. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's a mis that's a that's a misconstruing. Okay. So, the word Olympus in Greek means sky, mm -hmm. and there were actually quite a few mountains in Greece that were referred to as Olympus. Mm -hmm. There is one in particular, that's true, but there were others who were regarded as Olympus. And this, again, this is mirrored in the biblical tradition when it calls these high places. And what that means, so what these sacred mountains and high places and, and Olympus mountains, sky mountains, what that means is they function as a conduit into the higher realms. Okay. And if we look at the earth, um, if we look at the energy field of, of the earth, imagine it kind of like a, a sea urchin where there are these spikes of, of electromagnetic energy. Mm -hmm. And here again, there's yet another biblical parallel like Jacob's ladder. So imagine a mountain or volcano that is intensely charged with this geomagnetic electrical piezoelectric energy and it then creates this uh, conduit or this ladder or tower or tree. This is also related to the ancient concept of the axis mundi, the world tree. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a physical, literal tree. Well, it is physical and it is literal. It's just not a tree. It's, it's, it's a branching of electrical fields. So... And, you know, I'm sorry, I know this is a lot. But well, no, because it's cool, that's fine. <laughs> and, and, and so, this is why ritualistic activity was performed at these sacred mountains. Okay. okay. So, in other words, this is a place from which the gigantic hybrids could commune with their non-human progenitors. Okay. Not just in the realm above, but in the realm below as well. Because remember, it travels down into the subterranean realm. Uh -huh. And so a pyramid then is an artificial sacred mountain. Okay. An artificial geomagnetic 
mountain or volcano by which this energy is harnessed and they are therefore able to access it. Okay. Okay. So my other question I have now, now what, what comes to mind when you talk about these, these giant people, you know, that, that, that are, that, <laughs> uh, they must've been fairly smart to build these pyramids or, or did they have help? Do you think? Well, it's both. Okay. It's both. They were, um, and this is again, another major, uh, lie about, about ancient hominid mm -hmm. species. So let's take Neanderthal, for example. Sure. The science books will have you believe that a Neanderthal was a really dumb, monkey-like, right. primitive human. Right. Now, now I'm now they were savage, but there's a difference between savagery and and uh, stupidity or, or or lack of uh, intellectual capability. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are savage people running around right now. Right. So. And, and, okay, so backtracking a little bit, what they claim distinguishes us, homo sapien, or the word homo sapien means wise man. Mm -hmm. And what, what, they, what they claim distinguishes us is our brain size. And they claim that through evolution, a process called rapid encephalization occurred. Mm -hmm whereby our brains grew exponentially over generations, resulting in the supremely intelligent Homo sapiens. Okay. Okay. But Neander but it's a scientific fact that Neanderthal had something like twenty percent in some cases twenty percent more cranial capacity. Okay. So we ought not think of them as dumb monkey men when they actually had bigger brains than we do. Right. Right. Now, again, that doesn't mean they're like sitting around doing mathematics, but, but the capability was certainly there. And then, and then to answer your question, well, okay, so let's look again at, at the biblical tradition, and the, and then this is also present in, in Mesoamerican tradition and many others. Mm -hmm. These hybrid uh, offspring, and by the way, they weren't always gigantic. Okay, um, that's just a very common feature of them. Some of them were actually diminutive in size. But, but the point is, the point is they, they had abnormal and, and exotic genetic features. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they did have beyond homo sapien cognitive and physical abilities. But most importantly, to answer your question, yes, they had help because they practiced this communion with the non-humans that spawned them in the first place. Okay. And the, the biblical tradition, the book of Enoch, says this clearly, that um, so the non-humans in this context are, are these watcher beings, mm -hmm. um, seraphim. And seraphim translates from Hebrew literally to fiery serpents, uh, which again correlates to this uh, dragon worship. Okay. So by communing with their uh, non-human progenitors, they were able to transmit knowledge, uh, extremely advanced knowledge. And this is what enabled them to do all these incredible things that combined with their exotic DNA and uh, corresponding capabilities. That makes a lot of sense to me because I, I was wondering about that because, you know, when you look at these pyramids and you look at Stonehenge, it's all designed to, cor to correlate with, with, with the stars and, and, and all that stuff. So if these people, like, like you say, you know, we've been trained to consider these, these, the, 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 these people as practically animals, you know, with, without any constructive thought, how did all that happen? So it makes perfect sense. Right. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you, you even the even the casual observer um, can pretty clearly see through the bogus narrative. Mm-hmm. 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 So when you started to put all this together, um, how long did it take for you to do this research to figure all this out? And then I know you talked about you know, losing your job, essentially. When you presented this, what was the initial reaction to, from people? Well, so it's, it's, it's taken 20 years, really, to put it all together mm-hmm. and to bring it full circle into, into modern uh, paranormal uh, phenomena. Mm-hmm. I actually don't really like that word, paranormal, because mm-hmm. it's a misnomer. Mm-hmm. Just because we don't understand something doesn't make it paranormal right. or, right. or supernatural. It's right. just, those are just terms we use uh, for, for things we don't understand. Sure. But, um, yeah, it's taken over 20 years and, 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 and yeah, well, so the, 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 the establishment, uh, they, they, they will reject you and they will, and they will ridicule you and try to convince you that you're crazy or, 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 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, but that's, that's just, well, okay. So, so for the record, a lot of the participants in institutional science they actually believe the bs that they're shoveling okay so it's really only the people at the at the very top who know the truth the the people on the lower echelons are just going along with the narrative and they accept it Mm -hmm. because they really just don't exercise independent thought the way i do okay they're, which is ironic because they're scientists, right? 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 <laughs> or they're right. supposed to be, <laughs> right? But that's not the scientific method, right? Um, it, that, that's like a detective. Um, you know, this is we're, so we're talking about confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. If you have if you have a preconceived notion of something, then whatever investigation you do is going to reinforce that preconceived notion. Mm-hmm. So it's like a detective, you know, if a detective finds a dead, you know, let's say just for example, a dead woman and he immediately comes to the, to the, to the false conclusion that, oh, well, her boyfriend did it. Right. And whatever he looks at from, from henceforth is going to re, you know, he, he's going to reject anything that contradicts his preconceived notion mm-hmm. and he's going to accept everything. Uh, that seemingly uh, reinforces this uh, false notion that this this conclusion that he jumped to. Okay. Well, and there's also a degree of self-preservation, right? Right. People, uh, a lot of people in my situation would have just folded and and played ball with the orthodox narrative because they don't want to. They, they want. They're looking out for themselves. They want their career to blossom. Right. Right. Do you think there's ever going to be a time when they accept all this? Well, they, they, uh, well, um, not, not really. Uh, they're, they're going to continue to practice, uh, self-preservation and they're going to continue, um, to, to be railroaded by these institutions and, and the, and the, the people that that run them and and no the public is never going to no the, the scientific institutions and whatnot and the governments and and these people they are never going to suddenly tr- turn uh you know turn benevolent mm-hmm. and, and reveal uh the truth to to the people absolutely not and that's why i'm doing what i'm doing and why i'm talking to you today absolutely absolutely you know, this hour has gone by so fast. Thank you so much. I just learned so much from you today. Well, thank you for having me on. And I would just like to say uh, for, for yourself and, and your listeners, uh, have a look at, at uh, there's we have an Instagram account, My Apocalyptic Chronicles. Okay. And there's also a blog, markacarpenter.com on, on WordPress, markacarpenter.com. Okay. 
I've done various other such uh, interviews and podcasts. So you can find me on, on YouTube. And um, there's also a, a corresponding Patreon. Okay. And we, me and my colleagues, we, we fight an uphill battle every day uh, to bring people uh, the truth and, and authentic research directly from the field to them. So we really need your support. We're not billionaires and mm -hmm. we do not have the resources of, of the corrupt institution. Mm -hmm. And so we're waging a, a, a informational and, and spiritual war here. And we need uh, support. Okay, well, thank you so much. I would love to have you want to get to talk more about this. I could, I could sit here and talk for hours. Yeah, it, it, this, uh, <laughs> it's like that. So I understand. And sure, sure. Okay, Mark. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day, sir. That was okay. fascinating. I love history. Love it, love it, love it. Sorry about the dog in the background. Uh, I, I have a, a, a I have an Australian Kelpie who's about forty five pounds, about forty forty five pounds, and I have a rat terrier who's about maybe what eight nine ten pounds, and they like to play together and, and they will chase each other, and he gets over excited and they plat. So I mean, it's, 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 it's like a zoo. Anyway, that was a great interview, and uh, sorry it took me a while to get going on it. I, I, my mind was just one of those days. Tomorrow. Uh, Elena Gabor is going to be with us, and she's going to be talking about an interesting topic. You know, we always talk about past life regressions and things like that. Anyway, she's going to be talking about life beyond lives regressions, which I've never heard of. I talked with Nancy Mass the day, and she said, oh, yeah, 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 you know, this is what this is. And I thought, okay. You know, so this is going to be interesting. So she's going to be with us tomorrow at, uh, I believe, I think it's going to be a 1 p.m. Pacific show tomorrow. I'll have to double check that. Well, you guys will see the times on it. Because, in fact, let me check right now. Hang on a second. Let me grab the phone. Let me grab my little phone thing here. Um, because she's over in uh, Europe right now. So we want to make sure we get the, get the time straight for you guys tomorrow. Because, give me a second. Got everything on, you know, everything on my calendar. Ah, it's going to be 10 a.m. tomorrow. So... That'll be 10 a.m. Pacific tomorrow that uh, we have Elena Gabor on. So, you know, you guys that get home work, you know, from work later, we'll be able to see her as well. So, yeah, so we're going to be talking to her about that tomorrow. Anyhow, um, thank you guys for listening today. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you like the show, share it with five people. If you hated the show, share it with five of your enemies. Like I said, we're just trying to get the word out about our little show. Check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Twitter. Check us out on Twitch. Check us out on TikTok. And those dogs are probably ripping my house apart. Um, <laughs> and uh, check us out over at Twitter and on and Twi you know, all those all those good places. And oh yes, Ghosty Gal over on Instagram. So uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. And I want to make one quick announcement. Um, my class for uh, recruitment of investigators for my team has sold out. I may I may put out another class because I know I have people that were still interested. But uh, the other class that I have going on uh, on on the ninth. I think there's still there's still openings for that. So if you're interested in that, that would be, you know, that 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 might be good for you. In that maybe you don't want to be in a in, in, on a team, you know, where you have to be certain places, certain times. Maybe you just want to kind of go sit on your own and kind of hang out in a haunted place. This is a, this thing on the ninth is, is a class for you because I, I give you places that you can go and do this, take your family and do stuff like this. Plus I plus I show you the evidence that we got there, so you have a pretty good idea of, of what's there. So if you're interested in that, check out the California Haunts. Uh, paranormal team meetup. All right. Okay. I want to let you guys go and I will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific with Elena Gabor. See ya.